Hello and welcome to Nursing Care of Ventilator Associated Pneumonia, also known as VAP. So let's review the respiratory system here a little bit before we get started, just so you'll have a better feel for how we're going to get a ventilator associated pneumonia. So we have our upper airway there, as you see illustrated, the nose, the mouth, going on down into the trachea, then we go into the lungs, starting with our bronchi, moving down into the bronchioles, and eventually disseminating into those alveoli. In order for the infection, for the bacteria, virus, etc., to get all the way down to those lower sections of the lung, there's going to have to be some mechanism, some way that that bacteria or that virus is getting there. So let's take a look at that. Well, it could be contaminated inhaled air. So maybe there's a problem with our ventilator circuit that is allowing contaminated air in, or maybe we've tampered with the circuit and therefore allowed bacteria, et cetera, to get into the circuit. Another possibility would be oral secretions. And so as you look at this picture again here, you can see the upper airway. We have the mouth as part of the upper airway, and oral secretions can start to accumulate and move down past our endotracheal tube or our trach balloon, and then down into the lungs. As you may recall, when we fill an endotracheal tube balloon or a trach balloon, we're filling it with a minimal cuff leak, and we want it to have that minimal cuff leak, meaning that it's not too tight. It's not pressing up against the sides, the walls of the trachea too much. And if it did, what would happen is we get necrosis in the area where it's touching. So we want it to be filled enough to try to block most of this stuff, but not enough that it's completely occluding the trachea. And so what will happen is over time, some of these oral secretions can kind of work their way down past that balloon down into the lungs. The oral secretions, of course, it could be anything in the environment that is allowing bacteria or virus to grow in those oral secretions. Another possibility would be translocation from the blood. So we could have an infection that is in the bloodstream and then gets translocated from the bloodstream into the lung. Remember, the lung has a very high surface area uh, and a lot of blood flow. So this is a kind of a perfect way for us to be able to get bacteria across and into those alveoli. Highest risk is going to be at about 10 days from the beginning of that person's intubation or their trach that's been placed. Another possibility could be the ventilator itself. So we have a number of different components here that could be leading to or could be uh, contributing to the patient developing a ventilator-associated pneumonia. The internal mechanisms themselves could be contaminated. The tubing could get broken and contaminated. Uh, for example, maybe you're turning the patient and the tubing becomes disconnected. That might be uh, one of the ways that bacteria or virus is allowed to get into the mechanism. The humidifier could become contaminated and also connections. So the connection we have to the endotracheal tube, connections we have to anything else. For example, maybe the patient is getting aerosols to help to uh, bronchodilate and things like that. Um, those also may contribute to the patient developing some kind of bacteria or virus getting into the tubing. All right, so symptom-wise, what do we see with a ventilator-associated pneumonia? Well, one of the first symptoms we're probably going to see is cough. Now, if your patient is intubated and we have the patient sedated and possibly paralyzed, then obviously we're not going to see a cough. But what we will see is sputum that is forming, and we'll hear it, the change in breath sounds, etc. cetera. Uh, but we may also be suctioning out some of that sputum. So that's going to be one of the key signs we're seeing here, fever. We'd expect that there's going to be a fever. Now, if this is translocation of the blood or of the sorry bacteria or virus across that alveolar capillary membrane into the lung, the patient may already have a fever as a result of that underlying illness. So this may not be a good sign if it's a translocation kind of event. We'll see a drop in our oxygen level and an increase in CO2, indicating that our patient is having more trouble now trying to have that 
perfusion event occurring in the lungs. So there's two things that happen in the lung, right? There's ventilation, the movement of air, and perfusion, which is the movement of oxygen and CO2 across that alveolar capillary membrane. We'll also see possibly an increase in heart rate. As the tissues of the body are becoming more hypoxic, it's going to stimulate the heart to beat faster, increase our respiratory rate, and possibly increase the blood pressure as well. As the heart is trying to compensate, the cardiovascular system is kicking in there, and it's trying to compensate for this low oxygen state by pumping more blood. We may see increase in airway pressures with your patient on a ventilator, high pressure alarms going off, that may be another sign, and obviously what we're really going to look for in most cases to be able to determine that this is a pneumonia is the infiltrates on our chest x-ray. So the treatment is going to be avoid nasal intubation whenever possible. That seems to increase the amount of bacteria that gets down into the lungs. Turning and positioning the patient so we can mobilize those secretions, get them mobilized, get them out of there, so they're not providing this really good place for bacteria to grow. Increase the head of the bed, keep the head of the bed up to 30 degrees to help to hopefully prevent any kind of micro aspiration that could be occurring and also to help to mobilize secretions. Suction as appropriate. Okay, we're not suctioning more than we need to, but we do want to suction when it is appropriate. Use the saline sparingly. There's been 20 years of studies that have shown that using saline lavages increases the amount of pneumonia that your patients have and increase their length of stay. Section subglottic secretions, those are those secretions building up on top of your endotracheal tube. So we want to section those out too, section the back of the mouth down into the throat there if you can, to get some of those secretions out so they're not migrating past that endotracheal tube balloon and getting down into the lungs. And then lastly, of course, we'll probably be treating it with antibiotics. If you'd like to learn more about nursing emergencies, I encourage you to check out our nursing emergencies program and decrease complications, rapidly detect problems, and implement prompt action in your patients. See it online by going to thenursingprof.com. Well, thank you for joining me for Nursing Care of Ventilator-Associated Pneumonia. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now.